All right, good afternoon, everybody. Here with uh, Josh and Paul, of course, and uh, Melissa McCall and Chris Murphy. Uh, as you probably know, the American Rescue Act uh, passed uh, $1.9 trillion. Uh, really thanks to Dick Blumenthal, our amazing uh, congressional delegation, and special thanks to uh, Senator Chris Murphy, who worked hard to make sure that um, our state municipalities and superintendents had uh, the flexibility and time to make sure this money was really well spent. And I'm going to ask him just to say a few things, in particular his focus on kids and folks with disabilities. And uh, Melissa, as you know, runs the Office of Policy and Management. You'll have some questions for her, I'm sure, about um, when do we get the money, how do we access the money, and you won't be totally satisfied with the answer because we're still waiting for guidance from Treasury, but we'll do the best that we can. That said, let me just give you an abbreviated version of our COVID summary. I think basically the good news, this numbers go back to Friday, is um, the top positivity rate continues to stay low. The hospitalizations uh, goes down, so it's the lowest we've had in months. You know that was key for us. And fatalities, that's 21. That's over three days. Thank God that number um, is trending down as well. Uh, don't lift your guard. I mean, it's worth remembering that um, uh, the variant used to be known as the UK variant um, has gone from about in the 40s to 81, you know, in the last week. Uh, so we watch that carefully, uh, but it's worth knowing uh, it's not going up exponentially. It's going up more linear, but it's still something that we pay special attention to and very, very low incidence of the uh, South African variant. So we think we have a good handle on where we are, at least right now, in terms of the infections. And part of the thanks goes to uh, the vaccine program, which is uh, rolling out uh, pretty successfully. Um, you know, really special thanks to all of our partners on this, federally qualified health centers, the health care providers, um, really making an extra effort to get to the underserved populations as you can see, we've got about 75% of the 75 and above. Um, that's where uh, the bulk of the complications are. Almost 65% of the 65 and above, little parallel there. 25% of the 55 to 64, uh, and we're going to ramp that up. Uh, so it's over half of those over 55 have received their first uh, shot of the vaccine. We'll have an overwhelming majority of those uh, 55 and above will have their first shot by March 19th, which, as you remember from last week, is the day we uh, continue to cautiously reopen. Uh, 137,000 doses are scheduled um, for delivery, already arriving right now. So for those of you who said, um, oh, my God, my um, appointment is put off for uh, three, four weeks, what do I do? Remember, there's 137 new appointments that are being made available this week. So feel free to check in. If you get a better appointment date, please cancel the later one. <clears throat> and about 11,000 doses of J&J &J have been administered to date. American Rescue Plan, you've heard a lot about it, $1.9 you know, trillion. It's... I think it meets the moment. I, I've heard all the complaints. My God, how come it's uh, for more than a mass and ventilation? And why isn't it just specific to COVID health care? And why does it go on beyond December 31? Um, I think because the effects, the long-term effects of COVID are going to go on way beyond December 31. I know what that means for our kids. I know what that means in terms of our economy. I know what that means to small business. I know what that means in terms of stabilizing our municipal and state budget going forward. So um, I, for one, am I'm very thankful that um, you're going to see $2.6 billion in state relief, give or take, and $1.6 billion in, um, for towns and municipalities, local um, relief. And that money is supposed to be allocated through uh, the end of 2024. So there's a few years here. So we're working hard to balance that out make sure that, um, you know, the monies are invested in the most significant way where we can make uh, an enormous difference. Uh, I'm sorry for those that say, hey, great, let's uh, use all this money to reduce taxes. Um, I take it that is, uh, that is not allowed. This is supposed to be uh, incremental, and nor can you just pour it in the, you know, pay off old pensions. 
This is money that's going to be invested to make a difference for people. And let me give you a couple of examples in the next slide. So the American Rescue Plan, um, school support, learning, development, catch-up. Here, Chris is going to talk. Let me just um, just say a couple of things. Um, we have we've had more of our schools open than just about anybody else. Most of our schools, uh, almost all of them, for in-person learning, going back to September. But we still have a couple hundred thousand kids that didn't feel comfortable going back to school. And uh, they've been out of school for close to a year now. So um, what we do with this education funding is significant. It starts the day after uh, school ends in June. And um, we're going to talk very specifically about the ways we get these kids back engaged. And it's, uh, yeah, STEM and learning and three R's and book and classroom and lost learning is really important but also getting these kids socialized and back with their peers and some of the incredibly innovative programs we'll be able to afford, working with our camps, working with the not-for-profits, working with business for internships, ways that these kids can get back together, socializing with their peers and learning. The enhanced unemployment insurance benefits, that was about the end, I think, on the 14th or something. That will be extended another six months. I think it's a $300 um, plus up. You know, we're working hard. Our old creaky computer system over at Department of Labor has had to do some, um, you know, sprightly moving. But I think we're going to be uh, very close to be able to get that um, adjudicated on time. So you'll see those monies uh, relatively soon. Um, most quickest you'll probably get are the direct stimulus checks, hopefully within the next uh, two or three weeks. Um, that is money that comes directly from the federal government. That's uh, 14, you know, $100 um, for folks earning up to a single, um, earning up to about $75,000 a year, uh, more for a couple, more if you have uh, kids. Um, I'm very pleased with the uh, child credit um, I think that's really important. That's uh, $3,600 a year per kid you have under the age of six, uh, doing everything we can to make it easier for you to raise a family and make that affordable. Uh, it's super important now. Um, we have, if you heard me say it probably too many times, we have fewer women, a lower participation factor in the workforce today than any time in the last 30 years. Women have been particularly hard hit uh, by this pandemic, the first to lose their jobs, uh, slower to get back, often enormous child care costs and other issues. This is the um, International Women's Day, I'm told. So I'm really pleased that the um, emphasis that the American Rescue Plan placed upon child care and day care. We're going to have um, Beth By on very soon to say what we can do to expand the base of daycare, make that uh, widely available, universally affordable, you know, for as long as we can do that, to give you uh, the confidence that your kid is in good hands and that you can get back to work. A couple of other things, energy assistance and rental assistance, again, knowing that that doesn't end uh, in the next uh, 90 days, that we're going to have to have a glide path to allow you to pay those utility bills and to pay, uh, you know, rent and, um, and mortgage. And there's some uh, real support there as well. And um, finally, mental and behavioral health. And, uh, you know, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Chris Murphy. But um, people know in no uncertain terms what this has meant in terms of stress, what this has meant in terms of trauma. We see that reflected in our 2 on one hotline. We see that reflection in a in domestic violence and addiction, and we hear that all the time in terms of our kids getting back in the game. And nobody's been more of a leader in doing what he can to help our kids than uh, Chris Murphy. So, Chris, thank you for the great work you and Dick and the entire delegation did, um, and appreciate your work on behalf of the kids. Uh, thank you very much, Governor. Thanks for inviting me to say a few words uh, today on behalf of the delegation. Um, but first, just uh, let me quickly return the compliment. Obviously, we um, you know, have been uh, very proud uh, to be able to tell Connecticut's story over the course of this uh, pandemic. Uh, early on, Connecticut was a hotspot through no fault of our own, and we turned the corner um, over the course of the spring and summer faster than any other state because of your leadership and the fact that we um, just uh, have um, 
um, a can-do attitude in our state. People willing to step up in the education sector, the healthcare sector, small business sector. Uh, and now we can tell the same story of success when it comes to vaccination rollouts. Uh, I was uh, down in Hamden today um, uh, at uh, Cornell Hill Scott Health Center's uh, clinic, um, and they are um, getting those vaccines uh, out uh, as quickly as humanly possible. Every clinic I go to is so proud to tell me that, you know, over the course of the first two months, they, you know, only wasted one shot, only lost two shots. I mean, it is absolutely exceptional how efficient our operation is. And I think Connecticut is going to meet those national targets faster than anybody. Um, but I want to thank you for uh, allowing me to come on and say a few words today um, and perhaps uh, help answer any questions about the American Rescue Plan. Uh, you're right, this was a team effort. Uh, President Biden um, proposed this package. We made amendments in the Senate and the House. Um, but by and large, um, this is the plan that the president ran on. Uh, this was the mandate that he was given. You know, President Biden said that he was going to run the White House in a way that unified rather than divided the country. And a lot of people were skeptical of whether he could do that. Um, it's pretty stunning, the public reaction to uh, this rescue plan, especially in the wake of the partisan nature of the transition. Um, Seventy percent of Americans, including 60 percent of Republicans, uh, support what's in the American rescue plan. Uh, this is a package that has unified the country because, of course, this virus doesn't discriminate. And there is need uh, in every sector of the country, regardless of what your politics are. Um, you, I think, did a good job of summarizing what's in this uh, bill. But um, you know, let me just talk a little bit about this from a very sort of personal standpoint. Um, I started the day in New Haven. Um, New Haven is a hardworking community, but it has a lot of folks, you know, that are, you know, working for barely over minimum wage. Well, if you're working, you know, at or around minimum wage and you've got a couple of kids, um, the provisions of the American Rescue Plan are going to increase your take home income over the course of the next year by about a third. And why we built the American Rescue Plan by building um, up from the bottom of the American economy, right? Putting money into the middle class and into poor families' um, pocketbooks is because we know that that money is then going to be spent in the Main Street economy. We know that those people are going to take that money and go out and spend it in small businesses and restaurants and retailers all around the state. We think this is a plan to power this economy to close to full employment. But as you mentioned, Governor, we also built this so that it will hopefully be the last relief package that Congress needs to undertake. Uh, this is, I think, the fifth relief package that Congress has um, passed. Uh, this is going to be passed by the House tomorrow, as I understand it, signed by the President later this week. Um, but we want it to be the last one so that we can move on to other very important issues. And that's why, you know, we do recognize that the effects of COVID-19, the effects of this economic crisis are going to last beyond 2021. And so we do provide for an allowance so that these dollars, whether they're the money that go to the states, $2.6 billion coming to Connecticut, the money going to cities, $676 million under the, this package, or the money going directly to schools, um, somewhere in the neighborhood of a billion dollars for Connecticut schools. We want to make sure that those monies are able to be used to deal with all of the aftershocks that come from COVID-19. That means we want to be able to stretch out support to our schools because uh, the catch-up for learning loss is going to take a long time. We want to be able to stretch out support to small businesses uh, so that um, we can give uh, those businesses an on-ramp back to sustainability. Um, and we want to make sure uh, that um, the state um, has the ability to deal with the fact that there will be revenue loss that will you know, last for years because of this unprecedented crisis. Lastly, Governor, um, you mentioned the role that I've played in uh, the education title in this uh, bill. And, and so I'll, I'll end by talking about um, some of the work that um, uh, I and others helped lead to try to um, dot the I's and cross the T's when it came to the record 
education investment that we made through the American Rescue Plan. Um, in particular, I wanted to make sure that we were spending money on special education students with high learning needs and on summer programming. Um, Governor and I have talked a lot about the need to use this summer as an ability for kids to restart. Yes, some kids are going to need to spend some of the summer catching up with learning loss, but a lot of other kids are going to need to just have a really psychologically um, and emotionally healthy experience this summer. We're going to need to make sure that all of those kids that have been chronically absent, the kids who haven't signed on uh, to online learning, who haven't shown up to in-person learning, that we get them into summer programs so that we can assess their emotional and educational well-being so that we can reset them for the upcoming school year when we hope that things will be back to normal. Um, and so I'm excited to work with the governor and others to make sure that we you know, expand out the number of affordable summer programming slots for kids in Connecticut excited to take these education dollars and make sure that we wrap services around the neediest kids in uh, Connecticut. And we have a lot of them, and they're going to need a lot of help, especially when um, schools reconvene um, in the fall. So um, I sit on the Education Committee and the uh, Appropriations Committee, so glad to um, play a, a role there and look forward to working with the governor and his team on making sure those dollars land on the ground in a way that helps the kids who need the help the most. Um, thanks to uh, my colleague, uh, Dick Blumenthal, we work as a team. Uh, obviously, we're blessed to have the chairwoman of the Appropriations Committee representing Connecticut. The child care tax credit um, has been Rosa DeLauro's um, project for 20 years. Um, she has been the leading proponent of expanding that. Um, this bill, by expanding the child tax credit, uh, will reduce child poverty in this country by 50 percent. That is a um, just extraordinary uh, result of the American Rescue Plan. Um, so, uh, Governor, thanks for having me on, and thanks for you know being willing to keep in very close touch as we've uh, worked on this plan and negotiated it through to uh, near completion. All right, uh, thank you, Chris. Chris is uh, sticking around a little bit longer. Like I said, of course, Paul and Josh is here, and uh, Melissa uh, McCaw can do our best to answer questions right now in terms of the practicality of how this money is going to start to move. Channel 3 Eyewitness News. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, based on the new CDC guidelines for fully vaccinated people being able to gather indoors with no mask on, do you think that's going to change any restrictions here in Connecticut? Not for the near term. Uh, the the um, CDC guidance said, that, look, if you're um, hanging around with a lot of other people who have also been vaccinated, then... Um, you don't necessarily have to wear a mask if you're in a private setting, which is um, sort of good common sense, I think. You know, more broadly, though, it's going to still take another a month or two before the broad cross-section of people have been vaccinated. In the meantime, it's a good thing to wear your mask and show respect for them, even if you have been vaccinated. Thank you. And um, one last question. Is there a ticking clock for teachers and child care providers who want to get the vaccine, but they have not been informed by their health district, uh, you know, when they'll be able to, when those specific slots are for them. And, you know, will they be grouped in with everyone else? Uh, no, there are still um, folks who work in our schools are, are an absolute priority. 25 to 30 percent have already been vaccinated. If you haven't not yet heard from uh, your superintendent or your principal or local public health department, you will. And, and Governor, I just add, because um, we, we know there's thousands of child care providers out there, and, and there may be some who are still trying to figure out how they get connected in. On the website of the State Office of Early Childhood, uh, Commissioner Bai has a list posted there for every single town, if you're a child care provider, how you get connected into a vaccination clinic in your community. Thank you. News 8. Good afternoon. Uh, for Senator Murphy, when you talk about the American Relief, Senator, there's a, a, a lot to it, obviously, and a lot of people that can be helped by this. Can you sort of prioritize, and also with respect to the children, and, and even stuff like summer camps, how much of that is directed? So much has been discussed about the mental health of the kids away from their friends and uh, remote learning. How much would go into trying to help with mental health and stuff like that? Uh, 
Sure. So there's um, a, a number of ways to answer that. Listen, this is a substantial amount of money for America's school system, $130 billion overall. Uh, and the reason that we have made this historic investment in Connecticut schools and in schools across the country is because we know um, that kids have been hurt by this crisis. Um, you know, I'm a parent of you know, two uh, school aged kids and you know, they have all of the supports around them that they need to succeed. And I can you know, just you know, see how difficult it's been for them to keep up and how emotionally draining they are by being away from their peers, um, by having all of this uncertainty uh, surrounding their lives. Uh, so what this money really is dedicated to is building uh, support services, likely in many cases temporary support services, to last a year or, uh, or two around these kids to make sure that they, you know, have the uh, sort of social work and emotional supports necessary and that they have extra educational help around them to try to make up for that uh, learning loss. Um, we have given pretty substantial flexibility to states uh, in terms of how to use this money. As I mentioned, um, there's a small portion of the money that uh, must be spent on summer programming, and that is allowable not just for uh, summer school, but for summer camps as well. There's a small portion of the money that needs to be spent on uh, special education students, uh, on students with uh, IEPs. But broadly, schools are going to be able to you know, fit these dollars to their particular needs. Um, you know, we, um, you know, I, I think did a better job than most states in getting our kids back into school. But as we know, especially in Connecticut cities, there's a whole, you know, group of kids that have not uh, connected back with uh, their home school, and they're going to need, um, you know, some of those extra dollars, perhaps some paraprofessional support around them uh, over the course of the spring. Uh, summer uh, and fall. So it was not excited uh, for what we're going to be able to do to help make up for all of this uh, learning loss for kids. But I'm also equally excited about the work that we're going to be able to do to try to make up for the emotional trauma. There's additional money in this bill uh, for mental health programming. So community health centers get $6 billion under uh, the American Rescue Plan. And there's another $3 billion dedicated to increase um, mental health programming uh, for all citizens, young and old. So you're also going to see Connecticut's health centers and Connecticut's mental health centers get a major infusion of funding um, over the course of this year that will allow them to hire more staff and reach more people that have been in mental health crisis over the course of the last year. Thank you, Senator. And Governor, uh, many months ago, I asked you about the balancing act that this has been for you, not specifically uh, to comment about the situation uh, the, over the weekend at UConn, but it, when you put all the factors together in, in the, the metrics, trying to help the economy, and so on and so forth, how much do you have to consider that particularly young people being at the end of their rope in terms of dealing with this and then could act upon that similar to what happened this weekend. How much do you have to consider uh, how much time has gone by and where people are at and, and about letting their guard down? That's a, it's at the start of my consciousness uh, every day. I got to tell you, I, um, I lose sleep when I uh, think about these schools. A, they were closed for a while. Even when they were open, kids not there. Uh, I know the college kids as well. You mentioned the incident in UConn where there's a big party. I know the frustration. It's like a, a tight coil. Everybody's ready to spring at this point. And um, I'm just trying to cool things down a little bit longer. We're going to have be have overwhelming vaccination over the next few months. And um, that's what we got to do is get a glide path to that point. I understand where people are, and we're getting there. Thank you. NBC Connecticut. Monday, everyone. Uh, Colchester schools was closed today because of a significant number of staff having side effects from the vaccine. Are you hearing this happening elsewhere? And should school districts, parents, students be prepared that this could happen? I'm not hearing that. But Josh, you want to take that? No, it seems like an, an unusual case in Colchester. In fact, that clinic from Saturday, there were there were a total of six school districts that participated there. I think 700 educators were vaccinated. Uh, it seems like only Colchester had, you know, a handful of people call out sick and enough to uh, impact that elementary school. So um, we, we expect we don't see anything uh, unusual 
overall statewide. We have 11,000 J and J doses administered in the first few days they've been here. I haven't heard of any other reports, so people should expect some side effects: body aches, chills. That's normal. Um, the Colchester case seems um, a little unusual, though. Based how, um, how vaccination is progressing, do you feel like the timeline for when the next groups would be eligible is still on track? Yeah, very much so. We're making great progress. As the governor pointed out, a week into this next tier of uh, 55 to 64, we've already got a quarter of the population uh, there vaccinated. So our providers are doing a fantastic job. We had over 35,000 vaccines administered last Friday. That was an all-time record for the state of Connecticut in one day. So we're, uh, we're really cranking right now. And Senator Murphy, uh, my last question goes to you. You say that this is going to hopefully be the last relief package from Congress. What makes you think that this will be enough, given that we are still not over this pandemic? There are still restrictions taking place at this time. Uh, you know, I just look at the pace of vaccinations, the remarkable decreases we've seen in positivity rates and hospitalizations. And uh, I'm optimistic that combined with continued responsible behavior uh, and fealty to CDC and state guidelines that uh, we can um, turn the corner uh, and that we can get this country back on a path to full economic recovery. Uh, obviously, you know, you should probably never say never. Uh, and so I'm telling you today that it is not our plan to pass uh, another rescue plan, um, uh, but we will obviously be vigilant and sort of watch the trajectory of uh, coronavirus and its variants. But, uh, you know, I do see the work that we're doing on vaccinations, the work that we've been doing on prevention as a, uh, allowing us to put ourselves in a position to um, move on. And, and listen, there are, you know, other uh, issues that President Biden needs to deal with. We've got to pass an infrastructure bill. We've got to deal with climate. We've got a badly broken immigration system. Uh, so, uh, you know, Congress has, has other work to do, and that's why we decided to go big and bold um, with this plan so that we can implement it, we can let the states um, put the money where it's needed, and that Congress can, you know, have the room to be able to try to move to other issues that still, you know, linger as crises and as priorities uh, um, for the American people. Thank you. Fox 61. Hi, Governor. Um, we're still receiving emails from residents as recently as this morning who registered through VAMS and were told they would receive an email when they were eligible to sign up for a vaccine. They are now eligible, falling within the age requirements, but have not received that notification email from VAMS allowing them to schedule an appointment. Do you have advice for the people out there that are dealing with this type of issue? Um. VAMS can be a little clunky, but we've had uh, 775,000 people through a variety of different mechanisms, including VAMS, be able to, um, you know, make an appointment. As you know, we've, uh, you know, quintupled the number of people answering the phone for those folks who um, don't feel as comfortable doing it online. Josh, do you have anything to add to that? Just a couple of things. One, check your junk folder. Sometimes the email ends up there. Um, but aside from that, uh, you can fill out a form again uh, that might be able to re-trigger the, the invitation. But also a reminder, if you go to our website, ct.gov slash COVID vaccine, there are multiple other ways to uh, sign up for a vaccine appointment through some of the other large hospital systems, through the pharmacies, um, or through our uh, call center as well. Um, so that is just one of the many ways that you can uh, register for a vaccine appointment. Thank you. And then considering this new CDC guidance and the goal to have a vaccine for essentially anybody who wants one by May, do you have a rough time frame for when maybe mask wearing and social distancing in Connecticut would become guidance, not a mandate? Yeah, I mean, my preference would be once we get uh, closer to herd immunity. But uh, on April 20th, the legislature may have something to say about that. My strong recommendation is... Uh, Outdoors, uh, use your discretion. Uh, indoors, especially in a public place, continue to wear the mask. Thank you. And, and Governor, if I can just add, you know, yeah. what's important about the president's announcement with respect to May is that, um, you know, this is all dependent uh, on the American Rescue Plan passing and being implemented. Again, the House still has to pass the Senate version. The president has to sign it. But you know, in that legislation is um, $10 billion to increase the production 
of vaccines uh, and then uh, a new fund to help pay for the implementation of the vaccination plan. Obviously, you know, these vaccination clinics um, don't happen for free. Um, they are expensive. And so we need this funding coming down to the states, municipalities, uh, in order to pay for you know, what will continue to be uh, increased vaccination platforms run by the state and the state's partners. So um, in order to meet that um, sort of rough May target for availability, uh, we need this piece of legislation passed and implemented. News 12, Connecticut. WTIC 1080 News. Hi, for Secretary McCaw, where does the federal rescue plan put the state budget for this year and next? Uh, great. Thank you for the question. Uh, first, you might recall in the governor's recommended budget uh, that uh, we were relying on approximately $1.75 billion in federal relief um, that uh, would go towards revenue loss and replacement. The uh, bill that uh, passed the Senate that will go to the House does have approximately $2.6 billion in state relief. Um, so therefore, there's significant resources in there, depending on the final outcome um, of the budget and our work with the legislature to, uh, to support the proposal and to ensure stability in, our, in our, our programs, as well as to allow for additional investments that uh, the governor and the legislature feel are necessary. So we're in, a, we're in a good position relative to the work of Senator Murphy, our delegation, and uh, the rest of our counterparts in Washington. And for the senator, one of the things Mayor Bronin's going to talk about in his State of the City speech at 5 is expanding vaccinations into the city. There's been a lot of effort on getting vaccinations into the city, black and brown communities. What does the rescue plan do for that? And if those communities still lag in getting the vaccine, what can be done? Well, there's uh, $8.5 billion uh, in this package specifically for vaccination activities. And so, you know, my work now, once this bill is signed into law, is to get that funding down to uh, the governor's office and the Department of Public Health as quickly as possible so that it can be distributed uh, out to the cities uh, and to other clinics. Um, what we're going to need to do, um, especially as time goes on, uh, is massive outreach. Um, remember, you know, in a system that is first come, first serve, um, you know, the, the folks who, you know, I, I don't need to be convinced as to the importance of the vaccine are the ones that are going to be coming in the door uh, initially. We're going to very soon get to the point where, um, you know, the remaining folks in Connecticut who have not yet signed up may have some questions. They want answered about the, the safety or the efficacy or the necessity of the vaccine. So we're going to need you know, outreach workers uh, to do that. And um, again, you know, that's not inexpensive. So uh, the money that's going to um, the money that's going to the states and the local governments um, can be used for those efforts. But we also have this set aside of $8 billion for vaccinations and vaccination outreach um, that we'll be getting to the states very, very quickly. The Associated Press. The Waterbury Republican American. Uh, thanks very much. Um, last week, there was a bulletin that the Department of Public Health sent out to vaccine providers that was warning that they're, uh, they shouldn't expect any Johnson & Johnson vaccines uh, this week. Uh, has that changed? I, 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 uh, well, what, what's the situation there? No, that's that's correct. Uh, we did not receive any Johnson Johnson vaccine in our state allocation uh, this week, but uh, you know we did receive a substantial amount of Moderna and Pfizer, and as the governor mentioned, another in total 137,000 doses coming into the state. So our vaccinators will stay quite busy. Okay. And this uh, figure that the governor mentioned, about 775,000 people registering, uh, where did that come from? Number of first doses administered. Number of first doses administered. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and um, 
I'm not quite sure, uh, Secretary McCaw, I was reading through your, your written testimony, I unfortunately had to cover another hearing today. What, what essentially is your, was your message to the Appropriations Committee? Um, this is going to, you know, this funding issue is going to be taken care of in the budget so we can negotiate it there, or were you saying um, we can negotiate stuff in the budget, but if there's anything in the future, uh, the executive branch uh, would like to retain some discretion. I'm, I'm, could you maybe fill me in on what your message was today? Sure. So first of all, um, the governor and the administration fully respect the legislature as a co-equal branch of government um, and respect that we jointly want to make sure that stakeholders across Connecticut uh, receive relief where allowable under the American Rescue Act. There are a couple of distinguishing factors, first and foremost. How we utilize these dollars will be governed by the bill language, which we have not received, the final bill and the guidance that will be forthcoming from the federal agencies. Secondly, uh, our strategy for use of these funds is directly tied to the final determination of the state budget. How much will we need in order to take care of revenue replacement, um, final decisions on programs. Third, the bill is currently drafted does not really adhere to the current legislative process that we typically follow when we're appropriating funds for spending. Uh, one in which the governor would submit a plan, the legislature would propose uh, their plan, and the governor would have the opportunity to weigh in. We think that's critically important um, that some of these components get incorporated into the bill. At the end of the day, this is about ensuring that we have a balanced budget, one that provides stability to the programs across the state of Connecticut, and that we jointly make the investments that are important for the state of Connecticut. Those pieces need to fit together, and they need to be done in a way that um, complies with all the guidance that's coming from the federal government. The last thing that I think the governor's noted and CEO Josh Chabal's noted um, is that our success in Connecticut uh, has been linked to our nimbleness of us being able to respond to the needs when they arise. And so we do believe that the governor will need to have some discretion to ensure that there's flexibility in how these dollars are used. Um, so we will continue to work collaboratively with the legislature, but those are some of our, our initial initial positions on the bill as currently drafted. Okay, thanks for filling me in. And just uh, one last question for me. Um, and it might be to Josh or the governor or, or Paul. I don't know uh, who would be in the best position to answer it. But um, were, are you still waiting on guidance for, for nursing home visits from the CDC? Uh, I've received a call from a, a reader this morning from Naugatuck. His uh, wife of 47 years has uh, been in a nursing home. He, he wants to see, see her and see her more often. Uh, when might folks in, in his position get some more guidance, uh, either from the state or the federal government on, you know, something like nursing home visitation. Thank you. Want to take that, Josh? Yeah, no, the, I, I don't think anyone should be waiting for guidance at this point. CMS has put out extensive guidance with regards to visitation in nursing homes and where you have a case where, where there's no COVID cases in that home for a period of two weeks, which thankfully at this point is the vast majority of the nursing homes in Connecticut, uh, visitation uh, should be allowed. And so if people are having challenges with that, they could reach out to the uh, long-term care ombudsman um, for assistance. But, uh, you know, we expect all of our uh, nursing home uh, operators in the state to be in compliance with CMS guidelines for visitation. But last Thursday, you said you guys were, you would have been expecting some sort of uh, guidance on post-vaccination directions. Any, anything on, on uh, that? Yeah, okay, so this is an important point. The, the guidance that the CDC put out today with regards to um, activities that people who have been fully vaccinated uh, can engage in is with regards to non-healthcare settings. So uh, when it comes to nursing homes or hospitals, people need to keep their masks on, but it doesn't restrict visitation. Thank you. Hearst Connecticut Media. Good afternoon. Uh, so the state didn't receive any Johnson & Johnson vaccines this week, if that's correct. Uh, is there any news on an increase to the vaccine supply coming to the state in the near term? We've got a pretty good three-week window. We're getting J&J &J again next week. You know, the COVID task force um, was very clear that um, nobody across the country was going to get J&J &J last week, but now it's rolling back again on schedule. You'll con continue to see a ramp up, which I think keeps all of our projected dates for uh, other age groups on schedule. Yeah, I, I, it's worth noting.
way, too, especially with Senator Murphy on the line here, who was a fierce advocate early in the pandemic for using the Defense Production Act to scale up manufacturing of scarce resources, that the Biden administration has uh, announced a partnership between J&J &J and Merck, who's going to, under the Defense Production Act, start manufacturing the J&J &J vaccine and really help scale that up. Um, so I think we'll see more J&J &J vaccine in the, in the coming uh, weeks and months. Yeah, that's a, that's a partnership that's made possible by the Defense Production Act. This is a capability that the Trump administration used sparingly to be as, um, uh, as generous as possible uh, to the Trump team. Uh, what the Defense Production Act is going to do in this case is um, give Merck preference with its suppliers because in order to retrofit its facilities to make the J&J vaccine, uh, they're going to need to very quickly be able to um, d draw on parts and components from uh, the um, pharmaceutical manufacturing supply chain. The DPA is going to sort of give them preference, frankly, allow for other um, contracts to be set aside so that Merck can get what it needs to be able to start producing J&J &J vaccine within the next couple of months. Thanks. The Connecticut Mirror. Good afternoon. Um, the uh, the package uh, that you're talking about is historic as far as uh, how it addresses uh, child poverty. But the child tax credit will expire in two years. Some of this other money will go away sooner than that. So to what extent does this package underline what is the obligation that the state of Connecticut and the federal government has to attacking child poverty on a longer term basis? Well, let me just take that first. Um, listen, um, my hope uh, is that uh, Congress is going to choose to extend uh, this increase in the child tax credit and make it permanent. I, I think we are going to see um, the immediate benefits of lifting half of the kids who are currently living in this country in poverty uh, out of poverty. I, I think you're going to see that in their uh, educational achievements. You're going to see that when it comes to the benefit that accrues to their health as their parents have easier access to primary care uh, doctors and health care specialists. Um, so well, this bill uh, only implements this increase in the child ta tax credit for a couple of years. Um, my hope is that uh, when Congress sees the benefits and hears the clamor from the American public to make it permanent, uh, that we'll answer that call. So, yeah, there's no doubt that, you know, the, the state is going to have to spend this money in a, a way that is careful, right, because much of this funding is not going to be renewed. Um, but my hope is that the child tax credit will be made permanent after the country uh, and the Congress sees um, how impactful it is. When it comes to education deficits, um, I think most researchers believe that they cannot be made up in a year. And, and obviously, there's a lot we will learn about what has been the impact of this past year on uh, school-aged children. Um, but again, given that specifically the stuff you worked on is, is going to be there for a year. Um, what should the states expect as far as stepping up on a long-term basis to uh, reach out to these children? Well, the good news is that the education dollars can be spent over a number of school years. Um, and so there are some cases in which the uh, education dollars can be spent into the 2024 school year and beyond. So we recognize that you can't make up learning loss in a year. You can't deal with the emotional trauma of not being able to be with your peers or being at home in an unsafe environment um, in a year. So. Uh, I think school systems are going to be able to, to take this money and allocate it out over a, a couple school years. Um, that's good news. Again, I, we have to recognize that this, that this plus of informal funding is not permanent. So I think schools have to think twice before they hire more classroom teachers. But they certainly, when going out and hiring additional social workers or special education paraprofessionals, you know, will have the ability with this money to you know, hire folks for uh, more than one school year. Governor, the, the state of Connecticut um, 
the way it used the ARA money in 2008, 2009 set up a huge deficit for the out years. So what are you doing to make sure that uh, there is not another cliff that Connecticut's going to fall off of in two years? Well, first of all, I think it was um, helpful that the American Rescue Plan is two and three years out. I mean, it would have been really hard on us if it went through the end of this calendar year and then there was a cliff. So this gives us uh, an opportunity to plan accordingly. And like, uh, you know, Chris said, we might see things that work and things that are going to be able to continue forward, either with federal support or at the state level. Look, two or three years out, we're going to have a different economy, an opportunity economy, more growth. We'll be able to step up more. And I think the child tax credit is transformative. And any time that uh, Chris Murphy and Mitt Romney agree on something, it probably has some long-term legs to it. So I'd like to think it's a permanent part of lifting our kids out of poverty. I think, Governor, if I could just add to that, a couple other things that I point out. Number one, we had a $4 billion budget deficit, and the governor did not choose to close that entire gap by utilizing a rainy day fund or relying on federal stimulus, where there are where there are opportunities or initiatives to drive down spending, efficiency saving, or hold the line on increasing some of our programmatic costs. The governor did that intentionally to avoid the cliff effect. Secondly, all of this funding that's being poured into Connecticut's economy is all geared towards getting us back towards full employment and building our economy, which will help us to recover the lost revenues and to put us back on the trend of growth. So the governor was very strategic in putting together the budget that's before the legislature to control spending while at the same time really relying on stimulus to grow the economy. We're going to get back to a place of growth. We're seeing that in our revenue estimates. Um, and for that reason, that will help us with some of the cliff effect that the governor is trying to avoid. Thank you. The Hartford Current. Hey, everybody. This is Emily Brindley from The Current. Um, first question, I think I heard you guys give an update on um, the number of cases of the B117 variant. Would you be able to go back over what numbers we have now? Yeah, I said we were up to 81. Um, Josh, anything you want to add to that? No, that's correct. Um, there'll be more details in the evening press release, but we're up to 81 of the B117. And then we have one additional case of the South African variant to report as well. Okay, so that's that's quite a big increase in the number of cases of the B117 variant, isn't it? I think we we're at 40 or something before. Are these all from the past week or so? I think the last week and a half. Um, you know, as, as uh, I think Dr. Fauci predicted a month or two ago, uh, I think he predicted by the mid to late March, we would expect to see the B117 variant become the predominant strain in the United States. And I think we're on that path right now. The, we, we're meeting regularly with the team at the Yale School public health. They're doing a lot of the sequencing and modeling around this, and uh, they, they indicate that we are on that path in Connecticut, as we are around most of the rest of the country. Are there any concerns about that variant kind of picking up speed right as we're heading into the reopening? I'm not as worried about that because I've seen the variant down in Florida and San Diego now uh, close to two months. Uh, I've seen that the increase, it is increasing, it could be uh, the dominant, but at least it's not increasing exponentially, as I said before. And if um, we did find things were changing, we have the ability to change course. But right now, I think the vaccine is staying ahead of the variant, and that's it's slowing its uh, increase. And by the way, the vaccine works against the variant. Thank you. And then, uh, an unrelated question. Um, there was, I think somebody might have asked about this, but I kind of want to, I would like to elaborate a little bit. Um, there, is there any concern, again, as we're reopening about off-campus parties at colleges? Uh, there was quite a large party this weekend at UConn. Um, wondering your thoughts on whether those were, will increase and, and if you have any plans for uh, further enforcement. I tried my answer on that. Paul Mounds, do you want to try it? If Paul's not there, I'll um, – look, I, I worry. I, I, uh, I see these things. I see them as potential super spreader events, and I know that um, these are folks who aren't vaccinated. I know that young people are ones least likely to be at risk, but they can still infect others. So I've got to urge caution, especially for the um, invincible generation, a little bit longer. Paul, something you want to add? Yeah, I'll add something, Governor, and uh, 
the state police uh, led by Commissioner Ravella uh, and their team uh, did a great job of making sure to crack down on it. They are uh, the one thing Commissioner Ravella said that uh, we do have uh, individuals as part of our uh, state police force that are in these areas making sure these uh, parties are not happening. So they're going to continue the overall enforcement uh, for the overall public safety for here, the people here in Connecticut. But as the governor said, we're going to keep that in mind as it deals with us going forward. Uh, and we are concerned about that. And we're going to continue to uh, talk to our college communities about the importance of not having large gatherings, uh, especially as we get uh, further in the process and also the fact that uh, they're not fully vaccinated at this time. And one last question, um, Governor. Somebody else asked you earlier about the, you know, the timeline and whether we're still going to meet those goals. Um, is there any chance that we might be ahead of those goals, uh, especially with the president's announcement that that manufacturing is obviously increasing quite significantly? Yeah, I'm not going to predict that yet. But um, let's face it, they're ramping up significantly. Um, you know, as Chris mentioned, with the De Defense Procurement Act, we're going to have a lot more J and J slated. They've obviously doubled the order of both Moderna and Pfizer. So um, I think we're on schedule and we could be ahead of schedule. And um, again, one last thing back to those Yukon parties. Uh, when the Yukon women win the Big East tonight, hold down the parting. All right. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Connecticut Public Media. Good afternoon. This might be a question for Josh. I noticed today's numbers from the CDC that Connecticut is now behind the national number when it comes to the percent of the population that's fully vaccinated. What accounts for this? And are we having trouble getting people back for shot number two? No, um, there's a known issue with the CDC's reporting um, where they're misclassifying uh, some of our second doses as first doses. So there's about 64,000 doses um, that they have misclassified in, in, their, in their reporting. So we've been meeting with them for a week to try to help them figure out how to correct that in their data. Um, the data that we provide is, the, I think, the one that's more reliable, although it's worth noting that we don't have in our data some vaccine, vaccinations that are done in Connecticut by our federal partners, in particular the federal VA, um, who's been very active. So we don't get visibility to that. But the, the ratio of the first and second doses that the governor reported earlier is the is the more reliable one until the CDC can uh, fix the, the data flow on that. Okay, thank you. And uh, we've spoken with two professors at Yale, um, an epidemiologist and infectious disease doctor, and both were very hesitant about the state uh, reopening on March 19th and the way it is um, since they, we don't know the impact of the strains. And now we're starting to see more in Connecticut. Um, what or can you name the doctors or organizations who were um, kind of the guiding force behind the decision that March 19th there could be 100 percent capacity again? Why don't you take it this time, Josh? Um, well, look, I think as the governor's spoken about many times, he, he takes uh, advice, counsel from a wide variety of, of people, including public health experts. Um, but, you know, as we've looked at the uh, you know, the metrics and the trends over the last month to month and a half uh, consistently going in a very positive direction. The kind of unmistakable uh, impact, positive impact that our vaccination program is having on reducing severe illness and, and hospitalizations and deaths. Um, you know, I, you know, with, with a lot of that input uh, factored in, uh, you know, he made that decision. And uh, as he said, uh, the, those actions are still uh, a week and a half away. We'll continue to watch the metrics very carefully. And if we need to change direction, um, that, that's always his option. And is that the same date that state courthouses will be open to uh, a bigger capacity as well? Do you know that, Paul? No, I don't know that offhand. Uh, we'll be happy to check back in with judicial, uh, separate branch of government, uh, who's making those decisions as it deals with their courthouses. Okay, and last question, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Governor Lamont, did you say you are going to a UConn game this week? Uh, not to the uh, game this evening. Um, tempting as it is, um, I'll be watching the men carefully down at Madison Square Garden. That's a real possibility. And you feel safe doing that? Uh, I do feel safe doing that. I've had uh, my first vaccine going back now two and a half weeks. I'll have my second vaccine uh, very shortly. All right, thank you. And I wear a mask. CT News Junkie. Thanks, Max. 
Uh, Governor, some folks, uh, some attorneys at the Greater Legal Aid, uh, Hartford Greater Legal Aid and New Haven Legal Assistance have filed a complaint with the uh, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Civil Rights Office, basically alleging that um, your sort of age-based vaccine rollout discriminates against non-white folks and folks with uh, pre-existing conditions. I wonder if you might respond to that complaint. Um, as we've said before, I think um, rather than all gaming you see going on in other states as they play games in and around their vaccine rollout, which is much more complicated, uh, ours is based upon public health. And our rollout is simple, but it's also based upon public health. And it says that those who are most likely to be infected, most likely to suffer complications, most likely to die, are going to be the ones that get vaccinated first. And that's uh, based on age. And then we've doubled down with a separate allocation, especially for the most underserved communities, in particular the African-American community. We have to do a special outreach to make sure that um, they get vaccinated. And um, I think we're having some success there. We still have a way to go. What do you make it just in general, that claim that, that the age-based metric sort of discriminates against those folks? I think it's false. You think it's false? Okay. Um, Josh, you mentioned earlier that there was a website people could go to, these uh, child care providers who are not connected to schools or districts. Uh, we've heard some complaints for those folks. Do you have numbers on, uh, like, how big that population is and how many of them have been vaccinated? Uh, no, we're not, we're not tracking that. Um, but if anyone's having challenges, uh, child care providers who are having challenges getting access, they should definitely reach out to the Office of Early Childhood and they can uh, help make sure they're getting connected to vaccine clinics. Okay. Thanks, everybody. The Day of New London. <clears throat> Hello. Um, if I could go back to uh, a question about supply again. I know we've touched on this a uh, couple of times already. But uh, with both of the casinos in uh, southeastern Connecticut are, are online now with mass vaccination sites. And at both of them, they tell us that... Uh, they could be doing a lot more vaccines than they are, um, and they're just uh, limited by the supply. So just, again, how, how confident are you that it's, or when will um, these places have enough uh, vaccine uh, to give as many doses as, as the infrastructure is there to provide? I'm as uh, confident as the supply chain, supply chain is. is. We're in regular contact uh, with the White House and the COVID task force. Um, you're right. Uh, Foxwoods, Mohegan Sun, and all of our vaccination centers could handle two, three, four, five times of the supply. And right now, there's still demand for that. So, um, Chris Murphy, anything you do down in Washington, D.C. to speed up supply, we sure appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, this is, this, this is an issue of... Uh, manufacturing backup. Um, the President Trump left us with an absolute mess. He could have uh, ordered more vaccine from uh, Pfizer and Moderna. Um, he forsook that possibility. Uh, he did not use the Defense Production Act to put us in a position where we could very quickly ramp up those initial uh, vaccine products. So President Biden is playing catch-up. Uh, he's playing catch-up extraordinarily quickly. Um, we have seen every week an increase in vaccine allocations. No, it doesn't meet demand. But very quickly, once that second order of vaccine comes online, uh, and once the increased production due to this agreement with Merck begins for the J&J &J vaccine, um, we're going to move from a position of scarcity to a position of abundance. It's not going to come fast enough, uh, but this vaccine uh, money in the American Rescue Plan, uh, the $8 billion, is going to you know, help us increase the capacity to distribute that vaccine once those second order and additional J&J vaccine come online. But, you know, uh, President Biden was sort of put in a very unenviable position with not enough vaccine having been ordered. He's making up for lost time. So do you have any idea when will be this this quantum leap in supply that, uh, that you're referring to? Well, I mean, it's going to be in the springtime. I mean, the reason that the president has predicted that there will be enough vaccine for, anyone, for any adult who wants it by May 
uh, is that in the eighth, uh, around April, that second order um, of the initial two-shot vaccines, as well as the additional J and J vaccine, will begin to become much more widely available. Thank you. I guess that's it. Hey, um, first of all, Chris Murphy, thank you for working double overtime on behalf of the uh, families and kids here in the state of Connecticut. Great appreciation to you and the entire delegation. Um, let me just say very quickly, you see this um, from one year ago. It was one year ago that we had our first um, test positive. And uh, what a hell of a year it's been. And uh, We've learned a lot. You know, you see in that picture, look at those numbskulls. None of them are wearing a mask. They're not social distancing. Um, uh, but we've learned a lot in the last year, and it's making a difference. And um, I think it's making a difference you see every day in terms of um, how we're progressing in terms of vaccinations, how we're progressing. As long as you maintain the diligence and wear the mask a little bit longer, we're going to get there. So, look, to our team, thank you. Chris, thanks again. Take care, everybody.